Sachs, it seems like you took a week off from the All In podcast and people stopped talking about Ukraine. Uh, you want to give us an update? I mean, obviously, the war is not over, but it does seem like it, it somehow has fallen out of the public's consciousness a bit. Uh, I don't know if well, you disagree. I don't know if I go that far. There was um, the big event in the Ukraine war debate this week was that the House Progressive Caucus put out a letter signed by 30 progressive members to merely suggest that while we continue to fund Ukraine on a virtually unlimited basis, we also, in parallel, open up a diplomatic track with Russia to mitigate against the threat of us being drawn into a, the war and specifically a nuclear war. And just that very, I'd say, anodyne letter, that very um, tepid sentiment, really, they weren't questioning in any way the providing, again, of virtually unlimited support to Ukraine, that met with such a fierce reaction on social media and in the traditional media that I think all but one of the signatories recanted or walked back the letter. And kudos to Representative Rokana for not being one of the people who recanted. He stood tall and gave an interview on CNN and MSNBC saying, why has diplomacy become a dirty word? I voted for every single appropriation to give aid and weapons to Ukraine. I'll continue to do that, but I don't see a problem with us maintaining diplomatic relations. We might need those to avoid an unwanted escalation. Well, and here we are. Yeah. Kudos to him for standing tall, but it's amazing to me that the Progressive Caucus, which used to be one of the groups in Congress that questioned American involvement in foreign wars, like the Iraq War, they basically... They, they have moved off that, and they, they threw in the towel so quickly on this, it was really kind of pathetic to see. I mean, it, it really, like, this is back to Shakespeare. Like, politics makes for strange bedfellows. You find yourself aligned with the most left part of the Democratic Party in trying to just say, hey, maybe we should negotiate peace a little more fervently. I want us to pursue the right foreign policy, and I don't really care which party has well, the right idea. you said you would you would actually donate to anybody who yes. is pushing yes. for that. So did you actually make any, I mean, I, I, I it just I'm, happened, but I, I, I plan to donate to members of both party who push for a correct foreign policy, which I believe needs to be a little bit more restrained, a mm -hmm. little bit more questioning of what is in it for the United States. And we need to be careful about overextending ourselves. And we need to ask what is in America's vital interest. And so listen, will, you can support, uh, will you AOC can, be coming to the, uh, will, they, will, will AOC no, be she, doing a, she, oh, she, she's pro. She recanted. So uh, she's one of the ones that recanted. Well, what, what do you think happens in a situation like that? Well, how do they get them to recant? Yeah. yeah. Like why, what is the point of recanting something that was so benign? It's not. Totally. No, but what, what do you think? Ha like what, what's happening behind the scenes? Like why are people so afraid to say that, you know, you can be in support of Ukraine, but also still try to find a resolution? Why was that turned into such a scarlet letter? It's a great point, and I think it just shows the heat right now on the issue. Here, here's what I think. Does it, does it do that, or does it just show how the progressives as just kind of clown towns? I mean, it's, it's kind of sad. I mean, Jayapal, who was sort of the leader who put out the letter, threw her own staff under the bus. And I guess there was this snafu where the members all signed this letter in July and then held it for a few months, and then they put it out two weeks before the election. I can see why that timing didn't make sense. I don't know why... Like they release it now, not two months ago, not three weeks from now after the election. I can understand all those political considerations. But once you put the letter out to stand by it, don't throw your own staff under the bus. Because like you're saying, the letter was really a pretty anodyne statement of, hey, listen, do you think we can just have diplomacy on a parallel track at the same time that we're arming Ukraine? I just don't see the downside. But look, here's why I think they took so much heat is there's a lot of people on this issue who start with the end result of what they want. And the end result that they want is that uh, Putin and Russia leave Ukraine with their tail tucked between their legs, and they basically don't get one square inch of Ukraine. They believe that is the only acceptable moral outcome here. And they may be right about that. But then what they're doing is they're kind of reverse engineering all the beliefs that they have based on that outcome, that moral outcome they want to get to. So, for example, for the longest time, you heard things like Putin is definitely bluffing about using nuclear weapons. Well, how do they know that? They don't know that. They can't say that for sure, but it's what they want to believe because if you believe 
that nuclear war is a possibility, you might not go all the way for that maximalist position of the only acceptable outcome here is Russia leaving with its tail tucked between its legs. And I, hold on, and, and, I, and I, th I think the same thing is happening here with diplomacy is people who want a certain result in the war are afraid that diplomacy might result in something less than that. But right. that's not a reason not to engage in diplomacy and it's not a reason to deny the potential of this war to spin out of control, potentially into a nuclear war. Sax, Sax is like a walking thesaurus. So, J.Cal, for you, I looked up anodyne, and it means mm. not likely to provoke dissent or offense, inoffensive, often deliberately so. Yeah, like, uh, it's like oat milk. I know, you were looking, like, you were looking at the about, screen like, milk. like not, a confused yeah. little puppy when he said anodyne. So I Whatever, just I mean, listen, I got a thesaurus over here. Also, <laughs> I didn't know what it meant, so thank you. <laughs> uh, but... Seriously, what is the? F I want to know the fallout from two things, and then we're going to do a science corner. So, number one, what is the? I've been getting a lot of oat milk stands emailing me. Different brands of oat milk have been emailing me this week. Just give us an update, generally speaking, on the alt milk milk crowd and your inbox, Jamal. Oh, they're trying to. They're tr definitely trying to brigadoon me. But what these people like, you know, what's so funny about these folks? They have no judgment. Clearly. Hmm. Because they can't even say, you know what, it actually tastes much crappier than these alternatives, but I choose to for X, Y, Z reasons. That I could respect. It's the, oh my God, it's incredible. It tastes so much better. You know, look at my little horrible. mustache. I, it's you disgusting. Know, it's it doesn't ridiculous. foam properly. Ridiculous. It tastes like dishwater. It's ridiculous. Like, uh, and then Saks. Disgusting. This horrific uh, illustration of you in the New Republic I saw <laughs> um, look like dolly broke and they use dolly to make that illustration no offense to the illustrator who got paid a thousand bucks well that. it was like Has pre, there been any? it was pre ozempic sacks i thought it was yeah that's the problem if you're chubby sacks or chubby j cal it sucks when people base an illustration on a previous one but sax gonna, looks like a deranged <laughs> sociopath i mean you look it's like alex jones in a suit piece. well look they got elon and peter up there too it's such a stupid hit piece elon looks like hugh grant uh, Peter Thiel looks Look like he's rolling that. on uh, I'm not Freeberg's that tan Molly. For one thing. He's, not he's that rolling tan. on Freeberg's and Molly. He's got Molly jaw. And also, he's uh, he, he, he. You show a lot of stubble, which you also don't have. But look how fat they make you look. Look yeah, at your chin. You look like Phil Yeah, the chin. Yeah, the chin is. <laughs> Jesus, my <laughs> lord. But what I mean, what's going on in terms of the general reaction to the amount of attention you're getting for political? commentary now Sachs David Sachs will be our next Secretary of State well no I'm, I'm here for it I can't I'll, wait I'll go long that David then? Sachs will be our Secretary of State within two or three presidents 100 percent I'll, I'll take three. it he's got to make a little more cash my, my views my views are so out of step with the foreign policy establishment that's I wouldn't why feel you will win that's why you that's why I wouldn't feel the need to be so out there on this issue if the foreign mm. policy establishment was doing its job if you actually had you know people from the policy elite going out there saying sensible things about Ukraine, it wouldn't fall on me or and other China. people like, and China. like, like Elon basically posted that straw poll on Twitter, which was totally reasonable, got condemned for it. And then Bill Ackman, actually, who's been in Twitter spats with me before we've been on opposite sides of issues, actually came out and retweeted something I wrote as basically being supportive because the weird none thing of us want this war to escalate out of control. I think the weird thing is people are, there's a group in the in the media class, other podcasters, other journalists, who are saying you have no right to talk about this topic. And I, what I said is, you know, hey, listen, Sachs and I could disagree about things on the margin here or there. But I, I'm glad we're having the discussion. Shouldn't all Americans be having a discussion about our foreign policy and what our goals are? That's yeah. our civic duty is to have this discussion. So whenever you hear the political class, the podcasting class, the coastal elites, which we are part of, when they tell you you can't participate or this person right. can't participate in the discussion because they're successful in this other aspect of life, that's complete bullshit. Yes, Everybody should it. talk about this and disagree or agree and try to work towards some common understanding. You're right. So first of all, whenever they say, listen to the experts and you're not an expert, first of all, they're expressing an opinion themselves and they are expressing equally passionate opinions on the other side about this whole Ukraine war. So first of all, why are they allowed to have an opinion? So whenever somebody uses this, you're not allowed to have an opinion argument, it's always very selective and it's only applied to people they disagree with not to people who are equally inexpert on their side of the debate. So that's point number one. Hold on. Point number two is I've listened to plenty of experts, okay? 
I've listened to the IR scholar, John Mearsheimer. I've listened to the international development economist, Jeffrey Sachs. I've gone back and listened to our former ambassador to the Soviet Union, Jack Matlock. I've read George Kennan's interviews. I've read uh, Bill Burns, our current CIA director on this matter. There are plenty of experts who warned that our policy of trying to bring NATO right up to Russia's border would eventually blow up in our faces. It would poison our relations with them and lead to conflict and this war. So yeah. there are plenty of authoritative sources going back many years on this topic. And the problem is that the people on the other side of this debate simply want to memory hole all of these warnings and deny that they that this war was ever predicted. Because if this war was predicted, it means it could have been avoided. And they don't want to admit that this war could have been avoided. Or how about this? How about war is messy? resolving things internationally with dictators uh, can be very hard and nobody wins in some of these cases. No, there's no perfect outcome here. And right. you could hold in your head two things. Number one, Putin's a dictator, we need to hold the line and make sure he doesn't invade other countries. And number two, yeah, you probably want to keep normal relations with these people and negotiate with them to resolve conflict. I'm, I'm getting a little concerned about the saber rattling on both sides in China. You know, we're escalating all this chip stuff. We're escalating and Xi Jinping is taking complete control. I'm wondering who's going to meet with him. Who's going to talk to Xi Jinping about how we could collaborate together? Who's left to talk to him? Tim Cook? Well, there's, a, there's a bunch of unforced errors happening in China. How do we de-escalate? Well, there's a bunch of unforced errors that you have to let play out because they have huge economic implications. So hmm. I don't think this uh, is, I don't think this is a time for, again, I think David's generally right. We do not have time for adventurism right now because Oof. even before we engage in some of these other places there are a lot of you know uh, headwinds that are working against for so for example in china you have these massive demographic headwinds that are just building um we have to see what the chips act does in terms of follow through to china's ability to expand militarily or technologically there are all of these things that that you owe as a citizen of the United States, to see some more data on the ground in terms of its empirical impact before you re-underwrite a different strategy. Right now, the strategy is working. You know, we 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 are observing this, you know, one China policy. I think that's the right thing to do. And now let all of this other stuff play out. Can I say one thing about this? Yeah. The, the China. So what the administration did in banning uh, China from buying from us or any of our allied countries, these advanced semiconductor chips. That's what they did. They not only banned the sale of chips to China, they banned the sale of equipment that can make the chips. And they yeah. even prohibited American citizens and companies from, from working. working in okay. China to basically help them set up their own foundries and, and chip fabrication. So they are essentially cutting off China from advanced chips. That's the goal here. And, you know, we've talked about on this pod before how chips are the new oil, right? These advanced semiconductors are the new oil. So this is almost like an oil embargo of China. If you go back and look at it, it is. Yeah. If you go back and look What's at history. What's the reason why? The reason why is they don't want these in weapons, correct? That is the stated reason. No, it's well, exactly. I think we think these that's are going to go into weapons. That's, 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 the, tip the, tip the, that's weapons, the tip yeah. of the spear. But I think okay. the, the more impactful mechanism is to prevent an entire layer of infrastructure to be built in China that allows them to advance all of these next generation cyber capabilities, including a whole bunch of things in AI that we want to make sure that as often and as often as possible is, is for the United States and our allies as we choose. So all this next generation silicon will do a lot more to push that forward. And so if you put that in the hands of Chinese technology companies or Chinese governments, or the Chinese government in the parts that are actually technological, you actually increase the surface area in which you compete. By preventing that technology to go to them, you decrease the surface area in which you're competitive, and they are one or two steps behind and have and are forced to build it themselves. So Friedberg, if that happens, do you think that China escalates and says, well, why are we building iPhones here? No. I think China makes decisions a little differently than perhaps U.S. policymakers and foreign policy makers uh, make decisions. They think forward and calculate the series of events that will follow from that decision, whereas we are typically reacting to some event that's happened in the past, not necessarily always thinking through the second and third, or third order effects and consequences of our decisions. So the China calculus would likely look something more like 
if we were to say stop making iPhones here, we would estimate that the US would do the following to retaliate back against us. And as they do through that calculation, you end up realizing pretty quickly that there isn't as much to gain as there is more to lose by doing that. That would be my guess. I'm no China expert, I'm no foreign policy expert. But from my understanding of how Chinese policymakers do think and do make decisions, it's much more about what's the rational calculated set of outcomes that will uh, emerge and evolve from this decision. And in my experience talking with people in the United States that are in various communities of influence, it's much more about let's do what we consider to be the right or moral thing right now, and in response and in retaliation, and let's do an eye for an eye. So that's why I don't think that they're likely to be the first step in an escalation, escalatory ladder. There'll probably be a few more series of provocations before that may happen, at which point it may need to be kind of an inevitable step that they'd have to take. But what again, do you think, I mean, Sachs? Kind of I, it's, I don't know. I mean, so, so, so in terms of the motivation for this, I think it's pretty clear. This is an attempt to hobble the Chinese economy, not just the, all their weapons programs, but their economy itself, and hold them back and slow down their rise and their rapid growth. Now, is that a good idea? I mean, I think what this shows is we've moved from sort of economic logic, which is about finding trade surplus and win-win scenarios, to geopolitical logic, which is about balance of power. And this sort of ban on sales of semiconductors to them, it's very much geopolitical because it's hurting our companies, but it hurts China more. And so it's about, it's about, it's about increasing our balance They're, of power yeah. against them. And now listen, I think you can make the argument that we were overdue to be thinking in terms of great power competition and geopolitical rivalry. And this is an attempt now to correct the bad decisions that were made 20 years ago in terms of how we fed the Chinese economy until it became a pure competitor of the United States. So I think you can make those arguments. The, the thing that concerns me most about it is, do, do our leaders really have the bandwidth to manage a, a second front in the sort of great power competition right now? While we've got Russia and Ukraine going on, on the one hand, are they really ready to manage an escalation of the competition with China. And to Freeberg's point, have they really thought through all the second, third, fourth order consequences of this? Have they thought through the incentives this may create on China, for example, to take Taiwan? I mean, if Taiwan is the place that makes all these chips through TSMC, for example, and we have now cut them off, we have now embargoed them from these chips, does it strengthen China's incentive to go after Taiwan. Does it strengthen China's incentives right now to help Russia in its war in Ukraine in retaliation because they don't want to see they don't want to see Russia decisively defeated and then they will solely be in the gun sights of of US hawks. So I think there's a lot of things that could go wrong here when the US is now escalating geopolitical tensions and competition not just on one front, but on two fronts. And, and especially given how weak the US economy is and that we're headed into a major recession next year, it just feels to me like they are, you know, they are um, kind of putting their foot on the accelerator in terms of geopolitical risk at a time when we're not really in a great spot to be taking those risks. Well, also on a foreign policy basis, there, is there no common ground? Are there no things we could collaborate on and, and work on together, right? And th that's the thing that seems to be missing in the foreign policy for the last couple of administrations is, are there things that we could be building together? Are there things that we could be working on the environment, energy, sustainability, education? I, I don't know what it is. But it felt like, you know, with China for a couple of decades, we, we felt like we were working in a very collaborative way. And now it feels like every single instance is adversarial. Right. Know? Because the problem is that those policies of constructive engagement that you're talking about fed the Chinese tiger until it became a dragon. Yeah. And now so, it's I mean, the size it, of uh, Vagar well, or that, something. That, that, that's also a Vagar level, level dragon. <laughs> Vagar level <laughs> three. Vagar. Yeah. yeah. Big and, ass the, dragon. And, and the U.S. policy establishment in the Pentagon look at the rise of China and they're like, what have we done? We have created a pure competitor to the United States. We need to stop their economic rise. And I think that, again, I think there is a geopolitical logic and strategy to what the administration has done. But I question the timing of doing it at the same time that we have this unresolved war in Eastern Europe.
Well, it is nice that we seem to be getting some of this onshoring of chips and that money is actually starting to flow. It does seem like we're thinking a little bit like in decades and strategy. Wait, say the other part. I think Biden and Blinken have done a good job. They've done a good job on this right now. They've, they've played it well. Well, I don't know about that. I, I, I just later, come on. First of all, give credit I think where Biden, Biden, Biden and Blinken a did a job. horrible job. Hold on a second. Biden oh and Blinken did a horrible job. Poke the tiger. Hold on. Shemoth. Hold on. You poked the tiger. It, no, hold on. They did, I'll tell you where they did a bad job is last year. They had a whole year to negotiate to avoid this Ukraine war from happening. Biden even had a summit with Putin on June 16th last year. They never engaged in diplomacy. And now they have stacked this geopolitical risk with China on top of the risk they've already created in Ukraine. I, this policy may or may not ultimately turn out to be correct. I, like I said, I can see the strategy behind it, but I do not believe that Biden and Blinken have thought through the second, third, and fourth order consequences, just like Freeberg said. So I think it's a little early to be giving them credit on this. 